Holy cow, how's everybody doing? A little bit of difficult, technical difficulties getting things started today. I forgot to turn off my microphone. Hi, Sean. Hi, Madison. Hi, Donnie. Travis, good to see everybody. Alex, KB, Kayla, fantastic. Great to see the audience this morning. Violetta, welcome to class today. Fantastic. I have a small but very devoted uh, teaching teaching audience here every morning and thank you very much to every one of you who takes time to come today. Everybody doing well so far this week? I hope so. Um, uh oh, looks like we got Madison Gregitis uh, coming in via phone. Hello Madison G, it's good to see you too. Uh, did Madison Fitz show up? Is Madison Fitz here today? Maybe not yet, hopefully she'll show up a little bit later. So uh, today, uh, let me see, just a reminder, the exam will be available Friday morning at 6 a.m. Oh, hello, Madison, good to see you. Uh, the exam will be available, actually, it'll be available uh, Friday morning at 12.01 a.m. The exam's already available. What will become available is the password uh, on Friday morning, and you will then be able to access the exam using the password. Remember, you'll have all weekend and Monday until 11.59 to fin p.m. on Monday to finish the exam. Do y'all have any questions so far? Uh, you have to, it's a 60 item multiple choice question uh, test. You have 60 minutes to do it. You must uh, uh, complete it when you open it. No saving and starting and you're not supposed to use your textbook. Any other questions? If you do, go ahead and type them in the chat bar and I will answer them as they come up. And it looks like Madison G doesn't have any questions on the phone. So today we're gonna to be talking about uh, sensation and perception. And we're specifically gonna be talking about uh, the sense of vision, okay? So uh, I'm gonna to talk to you about sensation and perception, just to gen give you some general terms. Uh, we're going to identify where in the brain each of the five senses are processed. And then we're going to spend some time talking a little bit about uh, vision today. So that's sort of my plan for today's lecture. Bizarrely enough, sensation and perception is the oldest form of psychology. Do you remember la uh, the first week when I told you about Gustav Fechner, the first person to measure the mind? Well, he was actually measuring sensory experiences. And so... He, uh, he, he, uh, he, his, his work really was uh, the birth of the sensation and perception uh, perspective. Now, modern sensation and perception research is called experimental psychology. Remember, we were talking about areas of psychology, professional subfields. If you want to study the senses, you go into experimental psychology. Now, a lot of students make the mistake of thinking that experimental psychologists uh, are called that because they do experiments. No, all psychologists do experiments. It's just these people who did sensation and perception research were the first to do experiments. Remember how, how I told you that Gustav Fechner was, was the, represented the birth of, of psychology as a science? It's because he did experiments. Now, I told you about this thing called the just noticeable difference, uh, which is what your book's gonna call a difference threshold. And that's the smallest amount uh, that, a, that a, a, a stimulus has to change for you to detect the change 50% of the time. It turns out this is a very static number that never changes. It turns out that your stimulus has to change about 1 40th of its initial uh, intensity for you to tell the change. Now your book also talks a little bit about absolute threshold, which is one thing that was also measured back in Gustav Fechner's day that was in introduced in Gustav Fechner's day. Um, and it's the smallest amount of a substance that you can detect 50% of the time. And there's even a table in your textbook regarding some of the absolute thresholds uh, for different stimuli. You'll see the taste, smell, the touch, a fly's wing dropping on your cheek from uh, uh, just a little bit height above your cheek is what you can feel. Now, the thing with studying absolute thresholds is your absolute threshold uh, changes 
based upon your circumstances. So uh, your ability to taste salt in water would depend on whether or not you had just eaten a pizza, right? If you'd just gotten up and your, bre and your breath uh, didn't have anything on it, you would be very sensitive to salt in water. However, if you just finished an anchovy pizza, your ability to taste salt and water uh, would be somehow impaired and your absolute threshold would actually change. Now absolute threshold is one of the things uh, that's important. Uh, the modern applications of, of these concepts um, can be found in uh, brain and bionic interfacing which is teaching the brain how to uh, to interface with robotic arms and signal detection theory is important in medical and uh, military decision making. I don't know if you folks have heard anything about uh, the fact that doctors have been asked sometimes to list patients as having uh, co coronavirus even if they don't test positive for coronavirus. And people say, holy cow, these doctors are being told to lie. Actually, no. It turns out that an antibody test um, is only partially sensitive. It may miss small amounts of an antibody in your system if the levels aren't high enough. And that represents the absolute threshold. So an absolute threshold is the littlest amount that you can detect 50% of the time. That means sometimes these antibody tests may miss people who actually do have the coronavirus. So when we take tests and all that supposedly diagnosis as having this disorder or that disorder, remember that what these doctors are trying to measure is the absolute threshold of something in your system. And sometimes we miss these. We have to set an arbitrary point at which we say, hey, we now see this antibody, and sometimes we don't. So the applications of experimental psychology are helping build bionic uh, limbs that can be programmed to work with your brain, and this work in signal detection and uh, uh, military applications, right? Now, one of the things that I really want you to understand for this lecture is the difference between sensation and perception. Your ability to perceive a stimulus is dependent upon two processes, right? Actually, I'm even going to introduce three processes to you. I'm going to introduce the term sensation, transduction, and perception, because your book is a little mushy on the difference between sans sensation and transduction, all right? And I'm also going to introduce the idea of receptor cells. Now, if you'll remember in the biopsych lecture, I told you that there were motor neurons and sensory neurons, afferents and efferents. So there are neurons that run from your finger all the way to your brain, telling your brain what you feel. Those are called sensory neurons. And then you also have motor neurons going from your brain to your finger, telling your finger to move. Well, there's a third kind of neuron we'll call a receptor cell. And its job is to turn external energy into action potentials, right? So its job is to turn mechanical energy or chemical energy or wavelength energy into action potentials, right? So the light comes into your eye and that light needs to be turned into action potentials, right? S receptor cells do that. When you put something sweet on your tongue, uh, your tongue has to turn that sweet taste into a series of action potentials. The cells that are do that, the cells that do that are called receptor cells. All right. And each of your senses has different receptor cells. So in your eyes, you have rod and cone cells. In your uh, ear, you have hair cells. Um, in your uh, tongue, you have taste receptors that are in taste buds. And in your skin, you have warm receptors, cold receptors, pain receptors, and touch and vibration receptors, okay? So we have all these receptor cells, and their job is to transduce this external energy into action potential. So transduction is the process of turning uh, mechanical or chemical or physical energy into action potentials. That's a word I want you to know.
Okay, now here's the deal. Once that energy is turned into action potentials, it stimulates different parts of your brain. So you have a color center, you have a line center, you have a location center. So every time you are looking at something, you are perceiving it, you are seeing its color and registering its color. You're registering the lines and the shapes that make up that structure. And you're also processing the location of that structure. Think of all of those as sensations. Sensation is the process of recording sensory stimulation into a pattern of neural impulses. So when you look at a red shirt, your little red area in your brain gets activated, right? That's called sensation. Now, if you understand what it is you are looking at, then you uh, are engaging in perception. So perception is the process of making meaning of what you look at, all right? So think about it this way. A new baby sees a bunch of lines and the baby sees the sensation of a cow, but the baby has to learn that those shapes and those colors make up this concept, this idea we'll call a cow. Does that make sense to everybody? If it makes sense, type in your chat bar and let me know. I'm gonna go uh, along with the lecture. If you're confused at this point, please uh, type a message and I'll backtrack on it. Now, the crazy thing is, so when you see that, smell that smell, you might smell, uh, smell sweet stuff, but you're in that sensation, but your perception is, ah, oh, that's grandma's apple pie right? And visual illusions work at the edge of sensation and perceptions because what a visual illusion does is it creates a sensory experience that causes you to misperceive, that you misperceive, right? So I show you something that looks like one thing when in reality it's actually another. So visual illusions take uh, advantage of the fact that you have to sense something and then you have to perceive it or make sense of it. And all of your senses do that. You hear sounds, but then you learn what those sounds mean. You uh, record sensory experiences for smells and over time you learn what those smells mean. The same thing with visual images and touch. You understand, you learn the difference between a caress and a scratch, right? So sensation, perception, and transduction. Those are just basic terms that you as a sensory experience student, uh, a psychology student need to know. And if you look at this chart right up here that shows you the, uh, the in a sense, the uh, sensation, transduction, and perception, the transduction, sensation, and perception of the visual stimulus, in your book, it's gonna have a sharp chart showing you how this process works. And it's kind of just going to reinforce the idea that your sensory experience is composed of different parts, right? Turning that energy, that physical energy into action potentials, sending that information to your part of your brain to be sensed, and then making meaning of it, which is perception. I hope I wasn't too redundant right there. Now, it turns out that your brain is going to have various areas in the cerebral cortex that allow you to uh, to sense uh, consciously uh, these experiences. So you're going to have five primary sensory cortices. I have mo that's a, a plural for a cortex. So you're gonna have five cortices. And each one of these areas is going to be engaged in uh, receiving the sensory feed, the sensory uh, feedback or sensory information from the particular sense organ. So you have an olfactory cortex, which receives neural input from your nasal cavity. You're going to have an auditory cortex, which receives neural input or uh, efference, if you will, from your auditory canal. You're going to have a primary visual cortex, which receives efference from your eyeballs, right? And so each one of these cortex processes the basic primary uh, qualities of the sensory information, pitch and loudness, color, shape, sweetness, sourness, um, uh, and stuff like that, right? And so each of these areas, so, in your frontal lobe, you've got the olfactory cortex and the uh, gustatory cortex. So taste and smell are in your frontal lobe. In the front of your parietal, lo parietal lobe, you have your primary somatosensory cortex. So the sense of touch is in your parietal lobe, 
Okay, and then if you see your hearing is located in your temporal lobe, your auditory cortex is in your temporal lobe, and your primary visual cortex is in your occipital lobe. So what you'll see is that each one of your cortexes, uh, lobes of your cortex, has a sensory uh, cortex. And in fact, your frontal lobe has your olfactory and your uh, smell your olfactory and your taste. Um, now, if you'll remember a couple weeks ago or last week, I mentioned the idea of a thalamus. It's the sensory uh, way station where all your senses come through uh, before you consciously experience them. So your thalamus sort of turns your senses on and off so that you can pay attention maybe to what you're smelling or what you're hearing or what you're seeing. And all of your senses, except for smell, which maybe is so old, I'm not sure they know why it's not processed through the thalamus, but all of your senses travel from the sensory organ through the thalamus to the particular primary cortex, with the exception of smell, which goes straight from your primary or olfactory, uh, right from your, uh, uh, your nose to your olfactory cortex, okay? Now, <clears throat> here's the deal. Each of your senses uh, is composed of individual parts that are processed. So, for example, your brain processes sound in terms of loudness, how, ah, uh, and also pitch, ee, whether or not it's high-pitched or low-pitched. Excuse me, I know that's terrible. I know that's absolute terrible. But then these sounds have to be put together into larger pieces so that you know this particular pitch and this particular sound and whether or not I'm stopping my sound or, or beginning my sound. And you put all of those individual sensations together to form the larger sound, uh, the larger understanding of what word I'm saying. So if I say the word Bob... Okay, you're going to record the pitch, you're going to record the loudness, and you're going to record the consonants and vowels, and then you're going to put those all together to come up with a person's name. Now, the primary part of that sensory experience is processed in the, in the uh, primary cortex, but then it's put together in what we would call an association cortex. So in order to perceive me as a person, you have to put my color, my shape, and uh, the emotion that you feel when you look at me, you have to put all those together, and that allows you to say, hey, what I'm looking at is Chris. That occurs in the association cortex. So each one of these areas is going to have an association cortex where it puts together the parts of the sensory experience so that you can figure out what it's looking, what you're looking at. And even then, your different senses have association cortexes where you can put the smell and vision together to come to an even larger conceptual understanding of what you're looking at. Or you can put your hearing and your vision together to come to an even larger conceptual understanding. And these areas are called association cortexes, cortices, okay? Does that make sense? Now, one of the old time wives tales you might have heard is that you only use 10% of your brain. And the, that's because I think uh, there are only specific areas in your brain that control these specific senses. Now, if you want to destroy your taste, you need to destroy a very specific part of your brain, the gustatory cortex. However, if you destroy a cort, an association cortex, you don't necessarily see the behavioral deficit. Okay, it turns out that in your large association cortexes, for some reason, they don't work like your primary cortexes. So you can destroy some of your association cortex, and I, and I still may not be able to tell because I can't tell what things you can or cannot combine together. And so people used to think that parts of your brain didn't do anything. Those different parts of your brain that don't appear to do anything are the association cortexes that help your primary sensory cortexes work together. Does everybody understand that? If you do, please uh, type yes somewhere in the text bar. If you're lost and think this is weird or you don't get it, please feel free to type in the bar and I'll, I'll talk about that too. Now, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, vision. Today we're going to talk about vision, and then tomorrow I'm going to talk about all of the other sensory experiences. Okay, this does make sense. Please feel free to ask questions 
or send me comments if you want. Um, you know, I was wondering, I wonder if I came up with a live Kahoot that I could integrate with this, which maybe I could ask you questions as the lecture went along. Maybe we could even do it more of as a call and response. That's something I'm going to uh, invent for next semester. Good. All right. Well, that, if you don't have any questions, I'm going to carry on. So here's the deal. Your vision and your hearing, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, but I'm going to mention hearing, both record what we will call wave information. Turns out that light and sound are both promulgated on these things called waves. So light has wavelengths, sound has wavelengths, right? And if you've ever seen a wave, you know that waves have a height. That's the height from the bottom of the wave to the top of the wave, right? And then waves also have what we would call a frequency, how long it takes to get all the way from the bottom back to the, back to the bottom, right? And so it turns out that waves, the quality of waves are perceived by your eyes and your ears. So let's talk specifically about vision today. So light bombards through your eyeball. It turns out that light wavelengths bounce off of objects and into your eyes. Now, the reason that a shirt is red uh, is because it absorbs all the wavelengths of light except for the red wavelength, which is reflected back, and you see red. If you're wearing a blue shirt, it turns out that all the wavelengths of light are being absorbed into that shirt except for the wavelength of blue, which is bouncing back into your eyeball. If you're wearing a black shirt, you know what that means? That means that that black shirt absorbs all of the light wavelengths that hit it. And so what you're seeing is the absence of light waves bouncing back at you. If you're wearing a white shirt uh, and somebody looks and sees your white shirt, that means that all wavelengths of light are being reflected back at you and your eyeballs are seeing what we would call white light. Now, these uh, wavelengths bounce into your eye and are picked up by these receptor cells located in your retina. The retina is the back of your eyeball. It's actually part of your brain, uh, and we won't go into that in the, this particular class. But the back of your brain is filled with these receptor cells called rods and cones. Okay, And these rods and cones have proteins in them that are sensitive to light. Did everybody else lose sound? I appear to be having sound. Uh, I'm going to wait just a second. Madison G, if you've lost... Hold on, I'm going to send a message. Okay, so it must be uh, Kayla. I'm sorry, hopefully Kayla will get her life back on trap here. Okay. Good luck, Kayla. All right, so, um, so these light wavelengths go into your eyeball and bounce off the back of your eyeball called the retina. And your retina has these receptor cells called rods and cones. Rods and cones have proteins called opsins, and these opsins are sensitive to light wavelengths. When light hits them, they generate action potentials, and that how, how, that's how light is transduced into action potentials. You have these proteins in your eyes that are sensitive to uh, light waves. All right, and so these rods and cones are in your eyeball. Now, rods are definitely more sensitive to light than our cone cells. So your rod cells work in dark light. If you've ever been out in the shady afternoon, or if you've ever walked around your house at night, and you can still see the outline of all of your furniture in your house, your rod cells are perceiving light information. They work very well under low light conditions. Now, you also have these cells called cone cells. Cone cells are located right in the middle of your retina in a place we call the fovea. When you are looking directly at something, the image is falling on your fovea, okay? That's the center of your retina. Now, in your fovea, you're going to have almost all of your cone cells. Cone cells need a lot of light to work, okay? However, cone cells have three different types of opsins. They have an opsin that responds to light in the red wavelength. They have, some of those cone cells have opsins that respond to light in the blue wavelength. 
and they have some options that respond to light in the green wavelength. So you have three different kinds of cone cells, each responsible to a different wavelength of light, right? And so these cone cells give you color vision but only on bright days. And if you've ever walked around in the night, you'll notice that you can see your cat or your furniture, but you can't tell what color it is. And that's because your cone cell, exactly the primary colors. Fantastic. And isn't it crazy, KB, that your brain knows how to mix these colors and tell you that you're seeing orange or purple, right? And more impressively, uh, under different light conditions, your brain will still see red, even if you're under relatively low light or really, really bright light. It's kind of a bizarre phenomenon of perception that occurs in your brain. But that's a good point, KB. All right, so you have these receptor cells. Now, if you'll remember, I told you that the left half of your brain perceives your right visual field and the right half of your brain perceives your left visual field. Now it turns out each of your eyeballs, the retinas in each of your eyeballs sees the left half of the world and the right half of the world, right? And so each eyeball needs to transmit the correct half of the field of vision to the right, to the correct part of the brain, right? And so there's a color picture showing you a blue pathway and a red pathway. So the red pathway shows your left field of vision and it goes to your right hemisphere of your brain. And the blue pathway shows the right field of vision, and that goes to the left hemisphere of your brain to your primary visual cortex. Does that make sense? Now, the only reason I'm pointing this out is because I want you to know that there's a spot before you get to the thalamus called the optic chiasm. And if you look on a real brain, you can actually Google this and look at the image. It looks like a little X and you can actually see it in a living brain. And it's the place where the eyeballs transmit the information from the correct visual field to the correct hemisphere of the brain. You'll then notice that the uh, structures go through the thalamus and then on to the uh, visual cortex. Now, does everybody see those two little lumps? They're underneath the uh, thalamus and they're in shadow color. They look kind of shallows and they look like a couple of little, uh, little bumps. I hope you see those. Um, and I might even wait to see it to get a confirmation that you see them. They're little, little yellow lumps, two little yellow lumps. Okay. Now, those structures are actually called the superior colliculus, and I may mention them a little bit later. And it turns out some of your nerve fibers actually go to your superior colliculus, yellow shaded. They, they look like two little, I'm sorry, can I, I hope, I don't mean to be rude, but they look like two little breasts, if you will. I hope I didn't get fired for saying that. Right underneath the thalamus, right? Right there, look, and they, and these two structures um, are the superior colliculus. And what they do is they connect your sense of, uh, they connect your vision to your other senses. So if you hear a sound, your eyes know where to look to see that sound, right? Um, if you smell something, your eyes know where it is, uh, you smell something, right? And so your superior colliculus, some of the nerve fibers go to your optic chiasm, I mean, go all the way to your primary visual cortex, but some of them, uh, go to the superior colliculus and that allows you to use your ears to know where to look, to use your nose to know where to look, to use your touch to know where to look. That ties your senses together, the superior colliculus. So I do want you to know that structure. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the other structure. Now, if you know earlier, I mentioned your three different kinds of cone cells. Now here's the deal. There are some people who have red, green color blindness. Typically, this is because uh, they have a genetic disorder which causes their cone cells not to create the uh, appropriate kind of opsins in the red or green cone cells. So these people can't distinguish between red or green. Does that make sense? So color blindness doesn't have anything to do with your visual cortex. 
it has more to do with the proteins that your cone cells have, okay? Uh, briefly, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Gestalt principles of visual organization. Remember, I told you there are two processes, sensation and perception. It turns out that after you perceive things long enough, you begin to notice that there are patterns in the way things tend to occur. And you develop these uh, expectations and you use them to make decisions about what it is you are looking at. And we're going to talk about these as Gestalt principles of grouping. You know what? Turns out on the test, I'm not going to talk about bottom up or top down processing. So don't worry about those. Uh, Gestalt principles of grouping. These are the ways in which you organize your perceptual world. So, uh, and there are five basic principles. So if you look over here at proximity, most people are going to see three groups of dots. Rather than looking at 15 dots, you will see three groups of five dots. Actually, one of those groups has six dots, but you see uh, three groups of dots rather than 16 individual dots. If you'll notice over here, this design, we tend to see the little sand dunes on the left and the little lake on the right, if you will, or the ocean on the right. So we group the lines that are squiggly together as one group, and we group the straight lines together as another group. That's grouping by similarity. Okay, if you look at the uh, picture up here, holy cow, you can actually see the green line going through the back of it. Uh, continuity. You can either perceive it, uh, this thing as being a, a pink cylinder with two green, cone, two green squares on either side, or your brain learns to guess that that, uh, that uh, green bar is going behind the cylinder. If you look at the fourth picture, you'll notice that you don't see three angles, three V's. Instead, you see a triangle because your brain closes those designs in to create the, the image of a triangle. Remember, your sensory experience is not a triangle. You actually put that into the sensory experience. And then if you look here at uh, uh, item number E, illusory contours, uh, uh, you'll notice that uh, you don't see four Pac-Mens, four circles with bites out of them. Instead, you see a square bouncing out of the middle of this shape. Does everybody see that? And so after a while, uh, so newborn babies don't have these expectations, but they see the world and the world looks like this and they begin to make guesses. And these guesses then use them to make judgments about expectations in the world. And what you can do is you can create images like this. A lot of visual images use our expectations for how the world is organized to create experiences that seem impossible to see. Okay, give me a couple more minutes. I want to talk to you a little bit about depth cues. Now, your brain is amazing at calculus, algebra, and all of these mathematical computations, all right? When you look at an object, it turns out that you have two eyes, and they each see that object from a different perspective. The farther that object is away, the more similar the images between the two objects. So take your finger in front of your nose and close your left eye and then blink your left and right eye. And what you're gonna notice is that your finger appears to jump and that's because each eye is seeing it in a different location. The farther you move your finger away, the less it's gonna jump when you open and close your eyes because each of them is seeing a more similar image of the, of the, uh, of the object. Now what your visual cortex does is it compares the difference in the location of space between those two objects and it makes a guess about how far that object is. The more similar the two images from the two eyes are, the farther that object is away. The, the more dissimilar those two objects are, the closer that image is to you. And your brain is able to make those mathematical calculations second by second by second. And that allows us to drive cars without getting into wrecks. That allows us to play sports like baseball and basketball where people throw balls at us and we catch them instead of getting hit in the head with them, right? And so we use binocular disparity to judge distance. 
Now, that is what we would call sort of a sensory process, but it turns out there's also a perception process in vision too. Even when you ha are missing one eye, you can basically judge depth. When artists uh, paint pictures on canvases, they use cues to create the illusion or the perception of depth. When you look at a TV screen or a picture like the one here before you, you get the perception of depth. So it turns out that we also learn depth perception based upon how objects look. Just like we have the Gestalt uh, principles of organization, we have monop monocular depth cues, which are ways in which we are fooled into thinking that, that depth perception exists. Does everybody understand that? Please type in the chat bar and let me know if you do. Okay, now quickly I'm gonna go through them. I may give you one or two examples on the test uh, to demonstrate that. Um, so uh, typically we know that objects that occlude or block other objects are closer than those objects. We know that objects that are higher than others in our visual field tend to be farther away than closer objects. Um, we know that, uh, that uh, uh, if you're looking at two people and one person is really, really small compared to the other, you know that the person who is really, really small is farther away from you than the person who is really, really close to you. If you see a car and it looks a lot smaller than it should be, you know that that car is way away from you because you are familiar with the actual size of cars. Linear perspective. If you've ever drawn a picture of a road going off into the distance, you know you do that by making the road, the sides of the road eventually converge in the horizon and that's called linear perspective and if you draw the dashes in the middle of that road you'll notice that the dashes get close closer together as you move off into the distance and so artists when they create pictures they they use our learned uh, cues to give us the perception of distance off in the distance so what i want you to really take from this is your vision is a process of sensing the perceptive qualities, lines, shapes, colors, right? But then you also learn to interpret these, uh, these kinds of experiences, and you then use these interpretations to figure out what it is you are looking at. Does that make sense, everybody? I hope it does. Sometimes I'm looking at the computer screen and I'm not sure if the computer screen understands me, but I think it does. All right. So I just want you to understand the difference between sensation and perception and that your final sensory experience depends upon two processes. I want you to be familiar with where the five sensory cortices, primary sensory cortices are located. And I want you specifically to be familiar with rods and cones, which are the sensory receptor scale cells important in vision. I want you to know that rods are, work very good in low light and help us to see at night. And cone cells are very good at, uh, at giving us color vision, but they only work when lighting conditions are good. And then I do want you to understand that over the course of your experience, you have learned how the world is visually organized and you use these expectations to interpret what it is you are looking at. Okay, if everybody understands what I'm talking about, type me an okay in the chat bar or Madison, you can send me an okay text if you would and uh, let me know that you understood what I was talking about today. So tomorrow when we come into class, what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to talk about each of the other senses. So I'm going to give you a little bit of information about the sense of hearing, about the sense of smell, about the sense of taste, and about the sense of proprioception, which is a fa fancy scientific way of saying the sense of touch. Fantastic. It was great having everybody in class. I hope to see you uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m., when we, uh, when we uh, get together and talk about sensation 
uh, the second time. Hope everybody's studying and preparing for the exam because it is coming up, right? Uh, in a couple of days and the exam is going to be difficult. I apologize, in a 16 week semester I have three midterms instead of two. And so the exam would typically only be chapters one and two. Uh, but because of the, the semester, I'm having to push uh, one through five together on you. It's going to be a difficult, difficult exam, but if you study and you're prepared and you do the cahoots and the homeworks, hopefully uh, you'll do okay in the test. Uh, everybody have a great day, and I will see you tomorrow. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please consult your directory and call again or ask your operator for assistance. This is a recording.